So it's quite early in the morning and everybody's joining from handover. But my name is Caroline Foster. I'm a consultant in adolescent infectious diseases at St Mary's. Um, I've been asked to talk on HIV in children. Um, we'll cover a little bit about the global epidemic advances in prevention, um, a little bit about paediatrics, but you'll see why I'm mainly going to move on to teenagers. So we'll start with Donald. Um, this is a statement he made that AIDS, a bit like his opinion on COVID, is that it's completely over. Um, oh, and now my screen has stuck. Let me... Okay, so I'm going to start with a question. There may be very few of you there, but um, is Donald right? Um, yes, AIDS is over. No, AIDS isn't over. Or... Yes, he should be right. Vote now. Nicola, I'm not seeing a voting screen on mine. People are people are voting. I can see. Okay, then it must be my computer. Don't worry. Okay, so the most popular choice um, is no. Um, Donald isn't right, followed by a couple of people think he should be right. Okay. Um, actually, Donald, sh Donald should be right. The HIV epidemic should be over, um, both for adults and for children. And this is the power of treatment as prevention. So this is actually Trimec. It's a one pill once a day, fixed dose combination of dolutegravir, lamivudine, abacavir. You can take it from six years, 25 kilos. There are similar dispersible preparations um, in resource limited settings coming along. Um, and if you are on treatment, you do many, many things. So I'll show you the benefits for individual health. I'll show you treatment as prevention in, in preventing onward transmission of HIV the use of antiretrovirals to prevent people catching HIV. And obviously what we're really familiar with in paediatrics is the use of antiretroviral therapy in the prevention of mother to child transmission. So how does antiretroviral therapy work for your individual health? Right, if you are diagnosed at 20 with HIV and you take your medication, your one pill once a day, um, you have a near normal life expectancy. And this modeling is about eight years old. Um, and actually over time, particularly if you are diagnosed when you are asymptomatic and well with a CD4 count of above 350, normal CD4 count being between 500 and 1500, um, your life expectancy is now very near normal. However, if you don't have access to antiretroviral therapy, you're diagnosed at 20, um, you're like unlikely to live much beyond your 30s. How does that work for kids born um, with HIV? Well, I run a young person service that transitions into adult care. The eldest person born with HIV that I look after is now 36. She had twins, HIV negative twins, a couple of years ago. It's more difficult to model on that data for the perinatal infection. Um, but we certainly think um, a very good proportion will live into uh, late middle age and beyond. So treatment as prevention. Right, let's see how much everybody knows. Um, so a teenager on suppressive antiretroviral therapy for more than six months, which of the following is true? One is unlikely to transmit HIV. Two cannot transmit HIV. Three, must use a condom. Vote now. Okay, so we've got almost equal um, opinion for is unlikely to transmit HIV, 
or must use a condom. Right, let's have a look at the data. I'll tell you the right answer in a little bit. So this is the partner study. This, after antiretroviral therapy came along um, in the late 1990s when HIV went from a universally, almost universally fatal disease to a treatable disease, this is for me the biggest game changer. So this is a partner study. They took um, several thousand couples um, where one person was HIV positive on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, the other person was HIV negative. It included both heterosexuals and gay men. Now, this was a first in HIV studies because these couples were already choosing not to use condoms. Always before we've had to put condom preventative medicine in HIV trials. So in over 58,000 unprotected sex acts, there were zero transmissions, okay? And the study continued in gay men because it wasn't powered. But what that showed in partner two was that it was exactly the same for anal sex as vaginal sex. That if your partner is on treatment with an undetectable viral load and has been on treatment for more than six months, that you cannot transmit HIV. Okay, so the answer to question two was that never say must use a condom to a teenager, because saying must to a teenager is tantamount to asking them not to do it. Um, and that a person with HIV who's on suppressive treatment cannot transmit and that is u equals u and it's an incredibly important and empowering statement particularly for young people who are negotiating disclosure to partners it's a really different experience to say that i live with hiv but i'm on treatment my viral load is undetectable i can't transmit it to you um, and it has been an utter game changer for the young people that I work with. Um, so treatment as prevention, if you're on treatment, you can't transmit HIV and there ends the epidemic. So the WHO and UN guidance was targeting that 90% of people need to be diagnosed. 90% of those who are diagnosed need to have access to antiretroviral therapy. And 90% of those need to have viral suppression. So transmission is absolutely related to the level of virus in your blood. Um, so that's treatment as prevention. But what about preventing people becoming infected? Now, we may be in a COVID vaccine chasing era, but we've been chasing a vaccine uh, for HIV for 30 years with, you know, really disappointing results. Um, so how else can we prevent people acquiring HIV? And this is PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, where you take a pill, um, Truvada, tenofovir and emtricitabine. There are other drugs and indeed long-acting injectable drugs in clinical trials now. Um, but you take either, if you're a heterosexual, you take it daily because it takes longer for, if you're an uninfected woman trying to prevent infection, it takes longer for tissue levels in your in vagina fluid to increase enough to be prevention. If you're a gay man, um, you can take what we call event-based PrEP. This is, that's intermittent PrEP pre and post um, an, um, an episode of unprotected sex. Um, and if taken well, with good adherence, and one of the often the problems with any preventative medicine is adherence to therapy, that reduces your risk um, of acquiring HIV by more than 90%. And this has led to a massive drop um, in incidence um, of HIV seen across, um, across the globe, actually, where there is access to PrEP. Um, and is a really powerful tool in the armament. And you may remember from the press that in England, uh, PrEP has not been obtainable on the NHS outside of an implementation trial. Um, this has caused quite a lot of um, controversy, particularly because prevent, say, pregnancy prevention um, is available freely on the NHS. So it's... Um, 
as all these things within HIV, Andy and I were talking earlier about the power of patients um, in driving access uh, to therapy. So given that HIV is a completely preventable disease, how many people every day across the globe are infected with HIV? Is it 500, 1,000, 5,000 or 10,000? So this is daily infections. Okay, so we've got a lovely split of semi-optimists. Nobody's gone for 500 um, and pessimists. So the actual daily infection rate is just below 5,000. Um, so almost 40 million people live with HIV. Um, there are 1.7 million new infections per year in what is completely preventable. Um, one of the problems is testing, um, that a fifth of people are unaware of their status and therefore cannot access antiretroviral therapy. Um, if we look globally at the progress that has been made, um, we are seeing a decrease in new infections year on year. Um, I would just highlight Eastern European and Central Asia, and we have been, as part of the Penta Network, doing quite a lot of teaching um, but there the epidemic is um, really quite rapidly escalating and moving from high risk populations, so prison, um, MSM drug use, um, into the heterosexual population. So we're seeing more kids infected. And we do for children have the occasional nosocomial outbreak. Uh, Gareth Judah Williams was very involved with the WHO in an outbreak of healthcare acquired um, infection in Pakistan recently and certainly in Eastern Europe we're seeing um, healthcare acquired and that makes it incredibly difficult for families um, because if your child has acquired HIV through healthcare so that's um, reused needles for say vaccination or for fluid resuscitation in diarrheal settings as happened in Pakistan um, your belief in the healthcare profession um, is extremely tenuous. So we talked about the 1990 90 targets. Um, how far have we got? Well, about globally, 79% of people are aware of their HIV status. Uh, just over three quarters of those are on treatment and 86% of those are virally suppressed. So when you look at that as an overall figure, only just over half of people living with HIV um, are on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. And that's why we have 1.7 million new infections or 5,000 a day um, every year. However, enormous progress has been made over the last, you know, certainly over the last decade in the numbers and the scale up, particularly when, you know, 80% of people living with HIV are in resource limited settings um, and therefore scaling up access to antiretroviral therapy really has been an amazing feat, but we've got quite a long way to go. Um, however, the first use and evidence for treatment for prevention came from, from obstetrics and paediatrics, and this was in preventing mother to child transmission. Um, so if a mum is screened in pregnancy for HIV, takes her one pill once a day, gets her viral load to less than a thousand copies per mil um, and continues that medication for life. That includes during breastfeeding. Um, the risk of her passing HIV onto her child is less than 2%. So if you don't know your HIV status or have no access to antiretroviral therapy, about one in three of your children will be infected, which is why there are so many AIDS orphans in that you will have three siblings, one will be infected. The placenta is actually incredibly good. Um, less than 10% of transmission is in utero. Um, the rest is in about equal proportion at the time of birth, so peripartum, or from breastfeeding. So no intervention, a third of infants infected. Maternal antiretroviral therapy and breastfeeding 
And where there isn't access to safe formula, um, we strongly recommend breastfeeding. There were studies that showed that um, if you tried to introduce formula feeding in an unsafe setting, more children died as infants of diarrheal diseases and malnutrition um, than acquired HIV. So whilst U equals U um, is true for sex, it is not true for breastfeeding. And that's a combination of cell associated um, HIV in breast milk and also the fragility of the infant gut. So if you formula feed, um, your risk now is less than 1%. So if a mum's on treatment, chooses in a setting like ours to formula feed her baby, the risk of transmission is less than 1%. So breastfeeding in the UK, um, we used to say, um, in the pre-U equals U era, um, that any woman planning to breastfeed, that was required a referral to social services and a safeguarding issue. Now, whilst we advise formula feeding, you can breastfeeding and we will support you to do that because if a woman chooses to breastfeed, it's much better that she is supported to do that in as safe a way as possible than she covertly breastfeeds, which is what was happening in the past. So to breastfeed in the UK, you need to be on suppressive antiretroviral therapy as a mum. We ask you to breastfeed for as short a time as possible. We ask you to stop breastfeeding if you develop mastitis, bleeding nipples, cracked nipples. We ask you to stop breastfeeding if the infant has a gastroenteritis because the HIV transmission is through a permeable gut. Um, we ask you not to introduce solids. You can mix with formula, um, but there's very good data that early weaning, as was happening in resource-limited settings, increased the risk of transmission. And again, that's probably uh, the effect of solids um, on a permeable gut. You have to be willing to attend for monthly HIV PCRs on both mum and the baby. Um, if, and you have to be able to accept, and that's what I say to women, you have to be able to accept that there is probably a 0.5 to 1% chance that your child will become infected, and as opposed to no risk with formula. And you have to be able to feel that you could have, if you're that one in 100, you could rationalise your decisions with your teenage child. So... Given all of that data on prevention of mother-child transmission, um, on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, um, we have done amazingly globally in reducing the mother-to-child transmission, yet there are still um, around 140,000 children infected with HIV, the majority unnecessarily globally, um, and much of that is due to lack of access to screening in pregnancy so a woman doesn't know she's positive um, and you know lack of access to suppressive antiretroviral therapy um, so given that data how many children are born with hiv in the uk annually 25 50 75 or 100 so this is the year total for the uk Okay, well, we have got a good split of opinion, but the majority of you are optimists. Um, and actually, because we are so good at screening women in pregnancy and women who test positive, and the majority of the women living with HIV actually know their status now prior to pregnancy or on suppressive treatment, actually, the estimated number is um, that only around 25 babies are born sorry i'm trying to turn my ooh, trying to turn my poll off it's not going it's gone um yeah that's the great news it it should and could be zero why isn't it zero when more than 98 percent of people um accept antenatal screening we know that women who decline antenatal screening are a higher risk group through dry blood spot assays 
um, and that they are more likely to have had a previous HIV diagnosis, um, but for multiple issues, most of which are around stigma, um, they decline antenatal screening. Uh, some women deliver without antenatal care, potentially come into the country very shortly before they deliver. Very occasionally, we still get a failure of prevention of mother-to-child transmission. It's about one in a thousand women. It is not 100%, even for women on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, very, very occasionally, it's extremely rare, we do get a transmission for which we can't really work out um, the reason. But viral load assays measure in our setting down to less than 20 copies per mil. And we do know that if you use in a research setting ultra low um, assays that you do occasionally get uh, viral replication below 20 copies per mil. Um, women who seroconvert, so a woman is tested for HIV on booking, but obviously women continue to have sex and continue to have unprotected sex because they're already pregnant. We don't test partners, so women do seroconvert during pregnancy. When you seroconvert with HIV, you have a huge peak of viremia, um, and that spike of viremia means that you are much more likely, if you seroconvert during pregnancy, to transmit to your infant than even if you're chronically infective and don't know your HIV status. Um, we certainly had some women who in subsequent pregnancies have admitted to covertly uh, breastfeeding their infant. So if we now go to children, this is Betty. Um, she's a three-year-old girl. She is referred to your clinic because she's got persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. She's also previously been seen by speech and language for delayed expressive speech. Um, and you note that she had an admission to another hospital uh, previously for pneumococcal pneumonia, which she made a very good recovery from. Um, she is reasonably well grown. She's on 20th centile for height and weight. So this is where a bit like the old adage that we were always taught that you need to lumbar puncture, you know, 100 people for one positive lumbar puncture, 100 children. So it's exactly the same with HIV. Um, because if you test a child and find out they're positive, you will save a life. You will probably save two lives because it's likely that they acquired it from their mother. You may save the lives of their siblings and their father. Um, and what we want to do is diagnose all children before they become unwell. There are multiple indicators. Um, HIV is the commonest immunodeficiency. It's amazing how many kids we see um, that have had their immunoglobulins, they've had their T-cell subsets, they've had you know, their neutrophil function tests, but still haven't had an HIV test. I think it's amazing. Think of yourself as a healthcare professional. Are you happy to test a child with a raised ALT for hepatitis B and hepatitis C? And are you happy to test a baby for congenital syphilis, yet you still have an issue with asking about an HIV test? Um, so HIV testing, it's been shown, although we don't do it at our trust, that it is cost effective, that everybody coming in for bloods should, in A&E setting, should have an HIV test. And that on the adult side, um, everybody admitted to hospital should have an HIV test. We have seen newly diagnosed people within the trust um, in their 90s. So those are the sort of red flags, but really we should be screening as it's such a treatable condition, such preventable trans, uh, condition, um, think HIV test and screen very, very widely. Um, so Betty starts antiretroviral therapy. Um, everybody does. So everybody now, you have a viral infection, you have antiretrovirals that very effectively treat an infection with low toxicity. So the older drugs in the past had much higher toxicities, so we treated on a CD4 count guided basis. So initially less than 250 cells, then less than 350. Um, and now we've moved to treating everybody, not only to protect everybody's own health, um, but to prevent uh, the epidemic. So she starts treatment, she takes uh, 
dispersible tablet, one pill once a day, her viral load falls from 13,000 um, to an undetectable level. And she remains undetectable for nine years as she is able to swallow tablets at the age of five. She moves on to tablet formulations and then moves on to a single tablet regimen um, of Triomec. So she's just on one pill once a day, her HIV is asleep, she's at school doing extremely well. Um, and this is what has happened to the 1,500 kids, well, and nearly 2,000 children who have lived with HIV in the UK. And what you can see is that we have very, very few children. Um, the majority are teenagers, and the majority have now moved into adult care um, and completed their transition, which is why Betty is now a teenager. Um, because most of you working um, in the UK setting will probably never see a child. You'll see a mum living with HIV on suppressive treatment and maybe look after her babies, um, but you're unlikely um, to see a child. Um, and the teenagers are disproportionately affected by HIV globally. It's the only age group where HIV continues to rise and outcomes are poorer at all stages of the care cascade compared to adults in diagnosis, retention in care, access to treatment and in viral suppression. And this doesn't matter where you, whether you live in an African setting, so the red bars are adult rates of viral suppression and uh, the blue bars are 15 to 24 year olds and they'll be a mixture of the long-term survivors of the perinatal epidemic um, and the the newly infected horizontally acquired 15 to 24 year olds, which make up you know, about 40% of the global infection uh, with young women disproportionately affected to young men. Um, and that's both biological factors um, in transmission, but also um, a reflection on behavioral practices. Uh, and that doesn't matter if you're in a, what one might call a resource setting. So this is the States um, and you can see Care has improved, but you can see really shocking um, retention in care suppressed on, on for all age groups, but particularly for the youth population. And indeed, even in the UK and in 2016, we hit our 1990 targets. Um, but when you looked at access to antiretroviral therapy and acceptance of antiretroviral therapy, um, it was 10% lower in the youth and lowest in the perinatally as acquired, as opposed to the behaviorally infected youth. So Betty is 15 when her mum dies of primary CNS lymphoma, that's an EB driven uh, malignancy associated with HIV and usually with poor adherence to antiretroviral therapy. So unsurprisingly, Betty stops her antiretroviral therapy. She is difficult to engage in clinic um, and a year later turns up having had a delayed menarche followed by a miscarriage um, and when you see her, she has symptoms um, and signs consistent with pelvic inflammatory disease, but she attends with her partner, Dan, to whom she's disclosed her status, um, who is very supportive. And you're seeing her obviously in a pediatric clinic. Um, and this is the age where we're starting to look at transitioning to adult care. So this is the head school, which lots of you will be familiar with. Um, that just highlights the multi-dimensional complexities of adult life. Um, and if you try and think about doing that living with HIV, but also even with a chronic healthcare condition and trying to transition your care to a new team um, in adult services, it just highlights the complexities for young people. Um, and if you add HIV into that, you, if you're thinking of sexuality, you know, think of your first sexual experiences and negotiating your sexuality with a sexually transmissible disease before you've ever had sex. Think of living with the same disease as your mum, who's just died of primary CLS lymphoma, or has had advanced breast cancer or cervical cancer, or your father that has had an early myocardial infarction, um, or requires renal dialysis due to HIV nephropathy. Um, you may, 50% of the young people I look after have lost one or both parents, particularly the older cohort. Um, many have lost siblings. Uh, some are young carers. Um, the stigmatization around HIV means that you will live in a family, you will have HIV negative siblings, and they very likely don't know the diagnosis of you or your mother. That would be the norm. Um, 
80% of the young people I look after are of BAME ethnicity um, and the intendant immigration poverty. There is a huge amount of parental guilt, um, even for women who didn't know their status at the time. Um, and the sibling relationships can be quite complex um, between the uninfected siblings and those living with HIV. And if you're in a relationship, so Betty had disclosed to Dan, but if you're in a relationship and you live with perinatally acquired HIV, it's different to being a behaviorally infected teenager where you're just disclosing your own status. So for every young person who makes, has to make the decision to disclose, um, and if they're on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, they don't have to disclose. Um, making that decision also discloses the status of your mother plus minus your siblings and, or your father. Um, and that's a really complicated, as a young person, that's a really complicated um, thought process. And, you know, I have young people who've said to me, I don't care if he thinks I'm a slag, I don't want him to know the status of my mother, so I just told him I got him for a previous partner. Um, so, and the other thing to highlight, and this is for children with chronic conditions or adolescents with chronic healthcare conditions. We all think that because often they go into puberty later, they may be sort of wrapped up in cotton wool by their parents, that risk-taking behavior is going to be later and slower. But actually we're, we're wrong. This is some data from Joe Beagent, um, which basically young people who live with life, potentially life-limiting conditions are more likely to do risk-taking behaviors earlier and more of them. Um, and that makes sense when you think about it. You know, you, you sort of, you assess risk in a different way. You know, if, if you're not gonna live into your 60s, it doesn't matter if you smoke, you know, you're not gonna die of lung cancer. Um, so it's a sort of for us in our thought processes, you know, a third of under 16 year olds are having sex. That'll be higher if you're looking after teenagers with chronic diseases. Are we good about sex education in, a, in our generic outpatients, you know, access to contraception, preventing teenage pregnancy? Um, and teenagers may make bad decisions, but I can tell you what, adults make pretty rubbish decisions too, um, but only teenagers really um, get lambasted in the press. Um, teenagers have a very good excuse. That's the maturation um, of your prefrontal cortex, that basically there is a sort of biological and evolutionary need to get out of the hut. And that's where your thalamic drive um, develops before the sort of prefront, the frontal regulation, where we sort of think, and it's often using experience, and we use that experience to, you know, downregulate where our thalamic drive um, is pushing us towards. But anatomically in teenagers, um, the thalamic drive is often pushing them. And we don't only see this in HIV, this is looking at HbA1c um, control in diabetics, showing that poorer adherence starts in the teens, continues through the early 20s, but then actually if you can get people through brain maturation is completed around 25, which is the same as bone maturation, if you can get people through into their early 20s, they often do well. But you just have to ride that period um, and look at how you engage, continue to engage young people in the ability to access care and what sort of care you provide. So this is looking at CD4 counts and we can see that actually CD4 counts um, disappear before the point of transition. Uh, they start to fall, um, then continue to fall and slowly improve um, as they age into adult care. Um, but it's not necessarily transition itself. If that's well managed, you can mitigate the risk. Obviously, poorly managed transition um, increases the risk of poor healthcare outcomes and disengagement in care. But actually, it's more about the period of being 14 to 24. Um, so, this is looking at transition, which you will all be um, familiar with the definition. Um, and actually, you know, I think it's pretty shocking. I think across our trust, we are trying to do things for teenagers. Um, but the fact that if you break a bone, you go to an orthopedic ward. If you're a child, you have your own ward. If you're a pregnant woman, you have your own ward. 
but why young people, when their needs are clearly de demonstrated to be so different, um, don't have an inpatient service. I think we really need to examine um, across, well, across the UK. Um, this is what we do with our, we have the largest um, paediatric European cohort, but it's shrinking as the majority of them transition into adult care. We do a very individualized transition program. So if you are sexually active at 15 and it's easier for me to do your contraception in my adult service, I will move you over. But if you have learning dis disabilities, you can stay in paediatric outpatients until you're 21. So we have a very flexible, individualized approach. Um, and really, uh, we're trying to prevent the loss to follow up that occurs in the adolescent period um, because that's associated both uh, with mortality and morbidity for yourself as an individual, but also um, with onward transmission. And this is what we set up in 2006. And the reason we set up a specialist young person service was that the first five young people that went from pediatrics within the trust to adult sexual health services, only one engaged. And one of the main reasons was that they felt judged by the other patients in the waiting room because they were 17, 18, sitting in an HIV clinic and they felt that people were looking um, at them as to, oh, how did they acquire HIV? Um, so the stigma comes in all shapes and sizes and, and obviously a lot of it is internal. Um, so over a 12 year period, we have a combined, uh, so there are for an adolescent cohort, um, a combined death and loss to follow up of less than 5% and 80% are suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. So we've still got quite a long way to go. That actually, if you take the 1990-90 for the WHO, that comes out that you should have 73% on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. We do just hit that target because we have a very high diagnostic rate in the U UK, but um, we still struggle. So what do we do? We do afternoons, we do walk-in service, we continue till six or seven in the evening for young people, and we've continued the walk-in through COVID, um, obviously with a low, much lower footfall, um, but some young people, particularly doing telephone conversations where you may have parents in the room, in the next door room, in the background, it's really difficult to provide an effective service in that setting. Um, we try and make it multidisciplinary, so you get your HIV care, your sexual health care, your contraception, your Hep B vaccination, your HPV vaccination. Um, and when you're pregnant, uh, we help manage through that and we can do the infant testing. We have peer support integrated within the clinic um, and we have psychology and it's a true mixed adolescent and adult model. And I work with some absolutely brilliant colleagues in the 900 clinic. Um, we always say that the clinic is just not only about antiretrovirals. Um, obviously, if you are, for a young person who's struggling with adherence like Betty, if you cannot engage them in the conversation, you will never change. Um, we don't use any contracts. Um, we, even if you haven't been to the clinic for two years, you can walk in, we will just say, how, hello, how lovely to see you, tell me what's been happening. Um, it's a very positive, open model using a sort of motivational in in integrated uh, theme. Um, we try and make your medication as simple as possible, so one pill once a day, and we are using long-acting injectable formulations. Um, at the moment, they're two injections, quite large volumes, two mils, um, and we have a couple of patients. It's every four weeks, um, but the data is moving to every eight weeks. We also use quite a lot of sort of other incentives, text message support, um, our psychologist does hypnosis for young people who remember having really bitter liquids stuffed down them um, as young children. And actually you just put a pot of antiretrovirals on the table and you can see their heart rate goes from 80 to 120 just looking at the pot. Um, uh, this is, you know, and the old antiretrovirals had really horrible side effects. Um, this is a, a buffalo hump, a fat pad associated with lipodystrophy. Um, that's to remind me, I take um, people's pulses on the left hand side. We're all taught on the right. Um, and that's because particularly in young women, but also some men, majority are right handed. And if you cut, you cut right handed to left wrist. 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the mental health, but the burden on young people to look like, you know, to fit in with the social media is absolutely huge. So if you're trying to get someone to take medication that has, and, and even doliotegravir, you know, has associations with weight gain, it really is difficult um, to encourage adherence um, with that sort of toxicity. So this is Betty, um, age 15, she's off her treatment. Her CD4 count is about 100, dipping down to 50. You can see that she has a very intermittent pattern. So the top line is viral load. She has a very intermittent pattern of adherence. But the brilliant thing is by the time she's 25, life is a little bit more sorted. She goes on to treatment. She has survived with actually very few admissions with a CD4 count below 200 for a decade. Um, this always um, confounds my adult colleagues that actually young people can often survive for a very long time with a very low CD4 count and look extremely well. You had to have no idea, you know, I've got young people with CD4 counts of 40 who are, I'm trying to manage their obesity, even though it was called slim disease, you know, they're over 100 kilos. Um, which is why test, 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 you cannot tell if somebody has HIV by looking at them. Um, this is looking at our cohort that despite all our best efforts, they still have a mortality uh, nine times the age match population um, and a malignancy 12 times the age match population driven by lymphomas and not always in the setting of severe immunosuppression. We have seen both hepatocellular carcinomas and lymphomas in young people who have been on suppressive therapy for more than a decade. And that is incredibly tough to get a malignancy associated with HIV, driven by HIV, despite taking your antiretroviral therapy is psychologically a huge burden, let alone try to do chemotherapy and antiretroviral therapy. If your lymphoma treatment fails, we've had those who've gone for bone marrow transplant. Um, mental health, which I alluded to, so there's an uh, something called the ALFI cohort, which has closed, but was a long-term study where we looked at uh, adolescents living with HIV and their age match uninfected siblings. Um, and what we saw is that mental health issues with anxiety and depression were higher than what we'd see in the general population, but actually the siblings living in the same setting had very similar higher rates. Um, if you look at UK risk factors for adverse ad mental health, black ethnicity, migrant population, and that includes, but for psychosis, second and third generation migrants are at increased risk of psychosis. Um, parental unemployment, looked after children and poverty. So we have seen a 7.5% in the cohort psychotic episodes, starting between 14 and 26 years, and two thirds of these are on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. So they are non-organic, well, as, as far as one can categorize them, we don't find, you know, it's not advanced HIV and sort of HIV encephalopathy. Obviously, a third of the cohort have some form of learning disability. Um, less than 5%, will, around about 5% will never live in, independently. And that's because HIV is a neurotropic virus. And that's because they were diagnosed too late. Starting antiretroviral therapy as soon as you're diagnosed in infancy prevents the HIV encephalopathy, but it does not reverse the damage done. Um, so in summary, um, prescribing antiretroviral therapy is the very easy part. It's one pill once a day, it's no rocket science. It is, the difficult part sometimes is holding the risk, um, accepting that between the ages of 14 and 24, a proportion of your patients will stop taking treatment or will take it intermittently. Um, it's facilitating and working with them and keeping them engaged in the service um, so that you can continue to have that conversation and get them back on to treatment. Um, and it's making young people feel comfortable with the services that we are offering, that they want to come, that they don't feel judged either by those in healthcare and doing surveys on stigma for young people. Um, the stigma both adults and young people living with HIV experience within the healthcare setting. So that may be your GP, that may be your dentist, that may be tertiary services. That may be one of my patients in the trust who had learning difficulties needed a lymph node biopsy to exclude a lymphoma. She was bumped three times. She was always put to the bottom of the list, even though she was on suppressive antiretroviral therapy and there was no 
um, justification for doing that. And as a person with learning difficulties, actually she should have had priority within the trust to be first on the list. Um, so it's the only time I've been to the PALS service and as she doesn't have a mum and has a learning disability and I'd signed a consent form to complain on her behalf, which was actually quite instructive and got quite a response. So this is Betty's baby. Um, she's now got two children, both are HIV negative, and she actually now lives openly with her statement, uh, with her status and uh, works as a peer support worker uh, for other young people in Milton Keynes um, and has a CD4 cat now of over a thousand. Um, so in summary, we don't know the long-term outcome for these young people and that is the uncertainty. Um, however, many of them, we now have a couple of hundred young people who are well into their 20s and 30s. The majority have been to university, are in employment, are doing extremely well. They do face more challenges um, than their uninfected peers and really need uh, care to get them through um, that complex period of being, you know, being a teenager um, and a young adult. Um, and they need hope. So this is the second person who's ever been cured of HIV. Um, he's termed the London patient, um, although he's now living openly. Um, and he and the Berlin man 10 years before them uh, both had malignancies that required bone marrow transplants. And HIV enters your CD4 cells through the CD4 receptor and a co-receptor called CCR5. And if you, about 1%, particularly of the Northern European population, do not express CCR5 on their CD4 cells. So their cells are resistant to becoming infected with HIV. It doesn't mean they can't be because CXCR4 expression uh, means that you can still get infected CD4 cells, but it makes it much less likely. And both the Berlin man and the London patient um, had bone marrow transplants for um, white cell malignancies with CCR5 uh, deleted donors or CCR5 negative donors. Um, however, other people have had transplants with CCR5 negative donors, but have not been cured. But it, what it shows is it is theoretically possible um, to cure HIV, obviously a bone marrow transplant, um, compared to one pill once a day for antiretroviral therapy. But I think what young people really want, they don't mind taking the one pill once a day, but it is the stigma that comes with living with HIV. It is the exhaustion that comes in your late twenties and early thirties of every subsequent relationship having to weigh up the pros and cons of disclosing to that person. How do you predict what their reaction will be? Um, when the relationship ends, will they tell other people? Um, so, you know, there are a lot of young people who are very, very um, keen for an HIV cure to come along. And my colleague, Sarah Fiddler, um, is running trials, particularly looking in acute seroconversion. Um, and we hope to have um, a trial for young people aged 18 and over um, shortly, um, all halted because of the COVID, COVID era. Um, so, and I think really, this is going back to a rather nicer duck than Donald. Um, in summary, when teenagers are, their behavior is not what we would wish. Actually, I think the driver for teenagers is they do not want to be different. We think about them as the re most rebellious group in society, but actually they just want to be the same as their peers. They don't want to conform to old people like healthcare professionals um, or to their parents, but they just want to be part of the gang. And even to live with HIV, you won't have told anybody, but feeling you are not the same is incredibly difficult to negotiate between those very fragile, but wonderful years because it's so exciting, you're doing so much. Um, so I work with some fantastic people, both in pediatrics and um, in the 900 clinic and in the Jeffreys Wing, who've been unbelievably supportive, um, as have the college who give us space to do the 900 clinic um, in their clinical trials unit, because one of the things young people said is, I've never had sex and I have to go to a sexual health clinic to get my HIV care, that makes me feel 
really uncomfortable. So um, as a service, we've, we've had fantastic support from everybody. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thank And if any of the trainees want to sit in clinic, I, I know with COVID we're doing less space. Anybody to can face. hear me Okay, yes, Andy, my I can hear you. screen has frozen. If you can, thanks. Very much indeed to everybody. Andy, you're breaking up. I'm cutting in, a, cutting in and out. I've... Cutting in a... I just wanted to say to the trainees, yeah. I know we're doing less face to face, but if you want to come and, you know, sit in clinics, we're really happy um, to have people. And lots of trainees have done, you know, different projects, looking around issues around adolescent health, looking at stigma, looking at sexual health contraception. Um, so if you're interested in teenagers and or HIV, but it's really not about HIV, it's much more about you know, youth-friendly services. We're really happy to see you. And I like Mike's comment that stigma around antenatal testing has gone. Caroline, I think Andy was just flagging attention to us that there was, um, I think, a question from him earlier in the chat. Um, and he was just asking if we could answer that. So I think he's saying about a teenager acquiring another STD um, if the teenager doesn't use a condom, I think that came up early in your presentation. He wrote it in at the at the at the um, very beginning of the presentation. Yeah. So, if you aren't on treatment and you have both HIV and another STD, particularly herpes, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, you are at increased risk of transmission. If you are on suppressive antiretroviral therapy and you acquire another STD. There isn't good evidence to show that that increases. So we measure viral loads in the blood. We can measure them on a research basis in the genital tract. And if you have another STD, you do, if you're not on treatment, get more viral turnover of HIV viral turnover. The data isn't so good if you're on suppressive therapy. I mean, the, the, the question about condom use was, you know, slightly facetious. We absolutely encourage condom use in terms of prevention of acquiring another STD, even if you're on suppressive therapy. But for young people who are in a stable relationship, um, and particularly for young, empowering young women to use, you know, positive young women who are on treatment undetectable, it's often really difficult for them to get a partner who they have not disclosed to, who may be an older man. Um, you know, they may be 20, he may be 27, he doesn't want to use condoms, he wants her to be on the pill or the depot, or he wants a child. Um, in, the, in the migrant populations that a lot of these young women live in, they are as disempowered, many of them, as they are when I work in South Africa. I mean, you know, it's really shocking. You know, you're talking about additional contraception. Okay, he won't use condoms, let's do the depot. You know, he won't know about that, you have it in clinic. And they're like, you know, in clinic last week I had somebody, no, it's, it's up to him. And I'm going, but you've got two, two small children. Do you want another? And it's like, it's not my choice. And this is a relationship she's only known him for two months. So yes, we always condoms, we do doubling up contraception. So a condom plus, a long acting contraceptive is what we try and get young people um, to do. So, yes. Thanks. Are there any other questions on this call? Uh, if not, first of all, Caroline, thanks for a fantastic talk. Um, 
possibly the o the only time that Donald highlighting the only one of Donald Trump's statements that may be close to being correct. I congratulate you on that. <laughs> um, for the tra trainees on the call, the next call, the next one is by James Seddon on TB, the easy and the difficult. Uh, we've got a program up till the end of July. We're going to have a break in August. Please email me. I'm on the Imperial email or email Nicola. If you've got any suggestions, anything you want to do, any speakers, any topics, anything you'd like to do different, these sessions are put on. For the to help the trainees so please tell us what would be most helpful uh, so many thanks indeed thanks caroline thanks to those who came on thanks nicola for, for hosting this and see you all next week thank you thanks caroline Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much for doing all the tech. Oh, no, that's fine. No problems. It's not so bad. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for your time. Take care. We'll put up the link bye. this afternoon. <laughs>